Hi everyone. Um, it's good to see you. I guess you can see me, but I can't see you. I'm in my living room. The uh, I guess it's a sign of the times. I've got some cold symptoms, so I'm I've been here for a few days. I'm going to be here for a while longer, and yeah, I'm not going anywhere. So it's good to be able to uh, it's good to be able to to talk with you this morning, though. Um, you know, last weekend was the first weekend in over eight years since I've been in Vancouver that I've been in town and I haven't been at church on a, on Sunday morning. And it was strange. Um, this week, you know, giving a video message, it's strange. And I know there's a lot of people in different situations, um, different scenarios, but for a lot of people, that security and that regularity that you know what even if things are chaotic that there's a place I can go where I can rest I can pray and that's a home for me um, it can it can be a challenge to say you know what that's uh, we've always said that church isn't the building church is the people and now we're now we're we're faced with the challenge of okay we know that's true but how do we figure out, you know, how are we going to be the church right now? You know, the, the joyful church, the church that is free, the church that is loving, um, the church that's being creative and, you know, carrying forward even with, with different logistics, and the church that's saying, okay, we've done things this way before, but that was the form and not the substance. And we're going to take this substance and, you know, we're going to, we're going to be the church, you know, as much as ever and more than ever. Um, and so we're going through the story together. We're looking at uh, chapter 30 this week, which is Paul's final days. And this is how we're going to to carry forward this morning is to look at Paul and to see some of the, some of the, the things that Paul's life can teach us about how to be church right now. Because, man... That guy, in so many different scenarios, so many different church setups, had to be super creative in, in finding ways for the church to be the church. Um, and we're going to see some of that. One thing before we, we jump into that, just, you know, when, when maybe there's some fear or anxiety going around and panic sets in sometimes, our thinking really tends to narrow and one of the things that goes goes away with that is we lose the ability to be free and creative. Um, one of the one of the best lectures on creativity that I ever heard was by a, the comedian John Cleese of Monty Python, and he talked about his procedure for being creative, which is a fun thing. It's a playful thing, and he said I had to guard the time and guard the space. I had to make a a place where I knew I wouldn't be interrupted. I could take half an hour, maybe, to start to actually get creative. And he said, you, you, you kind of have to have that safe split, safe place, he, you know, to unwind, to, to think differently. And after that, the juices start to flow and you start to explore other avenues. And very similar to something the physicist Richard Feynman shares in one of his books about how he broke through a real kind of stale time in his life by, by just playing around and having fun. And I, I think the best example I can give for me is a story when I was learning to drive. Um, I was pretty anxious and so it was my older sister teaching me to drive and this one day we're driving home so she's in the front seat teaching me and my brother is in the back seat and I'm driving and we're going home everything's good and I'm signaling signaling you know right hand turn to on the way home and so I'm signaling my turn and Janet and Tim are saying to me no you can't turn here you can't turn here and I'm starting to, because they're, they're saying loudly, you can't turn. And I'm starting to get a little flustered. It's like, no, I signal the turn. I'm going to make the turn. Let me make the turn. And then we'll, I kind of know where we are. Then we'll make another turn. We'll get home. No big deal. Um, but I don't want to deal with lane changes. I, I'm focused on making the turn, making the turn cleanly, right speed, whatever. I don't, don't make me make quick changes. I don't like that. Well, 
I made the turn and I realized what they were trying to say, which is the subtle difference between you can't make the turn and you shouldn't make the turn. Because what they meant by you can't turn here was that it was one way street and I saw three sets of headlights, you know, three lanes of oncoming traffic <laughs> coming at me. Um, and uh, fortunately, God was good that day. There was a parking lot right on the corner. So I turned and immediately turned back into the parking lot. And then we had a little pause and we had a little discussion. But I was anxious and I was completely focused on one thing. And it turned out that uh, it wasn't the right thing. Uh, it wasn't the most important thing. And we can get like that when we're afraid. We can get like that when we're anxious about something and we lose freedom. Um, we lose that creativity. And um, when we're carrying our fears and we're carrying our anxieties, uh, yeah, we, we focus narrowly on one thing and um, it might not be the right thing. But let's, uh, let's take a look at Paul and, and Paul's life. And I'm going to take a look at three... Uh, three phases in Paul's life. This is right at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry. The first place we're going to look at is when he's saying goodbye to the elders in the church in Ephesus. He's going to be saying farewell to them because he's going to be traveling to Jerusalem and it's going to be dangerous. There's a lot of opposition to his message in Jerusalem and uh, it's he knows that he knows that it's a risky thing to do. The second phase, he's going to second phase or place that we're going to look at is he will have gone to Jerusalem. He will have been arrested there. He will have spent, you know, a couple years in prison there. He will have appealed to the judgment of Caesar to go to Rome. On the journey to Rome, he will be shipwrecked. He'll be snake bitten. It's going to be a tumultuous journey to get to Rome. When he gets to Rome, he's going to be in house, under house arrest for a number of years. And so the second period is when he's in house arrest in Rome, and he'll be writing back to that church in Ephesus, and he'll be writing a blessing to them. And the third, uh, the third phase that we're going to look at is some years late after that, when he's again imprisoned in Rome and he knows that uh, he he knows that the end is near for him and there he's writing to a young disciple Timothy and he's giving his final final words to him so if you have your story with you let's turn to uh, this is page 300 and, uh, sorry 439 and pages 440 and so this is Paul uh, Speaking to, the, speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus. And this is what he says. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. So Paul travels on after saying goodbye there, and he goes to Caesarea. And in Caesarea, there's a prophet who takes Paul's belt and ties up Paul's hands and says, this is how the Jews are going to tie you up 
and hand you over to the Gentiles, to the, Romans, to the Roman authorities. And he prophesies, you didn't know what was going to happen to you? Well, this is what's going to happen to you. And uh, I'll, read for, I'll read a little more here. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we started our way up to Jerusalem. And what strikes me about these two instances is Paul is really free. He's about to walk into prison. He's about to walk into captivity. But he's really free. He's saying, I'm ready. And there's a bunch of people around him, including Luke, writing this in Acts, who are saying, you can't do this. No, this is not an option. Uh, you can't go to Jerusalem. And Paul is, Paul is saying, no. The Holy Spirit says, go. And it, it really shows that tunnel vision of anxiety where, according to the circumstance, you can't go. According to the circumstance, um, it's not an option. But Paul, he has this clarity to hear from the Holy Spirit and to not let the voice of anxiety, the, the voice of what's going on in the other circumstances, choke that out. And we can see as we read on and as you read through this chapter and study it this week, you'll see that what's going to make this last section of his ministry effective, that's, that really where his power in that is going to be, is, is through his obedience to the Holy Spirit. That um, in this situation where it looks like it's not an option, he, ha he actually has the ability to, to say, no, this is what God's asking for, and so therefore it is an option, and therefore it's the only option um, but his language is so powerful, right? Because he's saying, I consider my life not worth anything except in obedience to the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, um, I'm ready to die. And when I say that he's free, it's because he's saying these things which is, I mean, you can't take that lightly. Um, and Paul doesn't take it lightly. Uh, but as he says, he's ready. And this effectiveness that he's going to have is going to come from, from this freedom. Um, he's not going to be alone, though. As he, as he goes through this process, you know, the Lord's going to meet with him. You know, when he's in Jerusalem, the Lord's going to meet with him and says, you've testified here, you're going to testify in Rome. And God's not abandoning him. He's not doing this alone. Um, God's with him every single step of the way. Um, but in this scenario where the, the ordinary human analysis is saying, you can't go, Paul's got that different vision, and he really understands you know what, it's not the effectiveness of my effort, it's what God's doing that is really important. Um, but he has that freedom in order to obey. The second phase that we're going to, to hear from Paul is when he's writing, again in prison in Rome, writing back to that same church in Ephesus. And what I want to, what I want to look for here is that he kind of gives us a glimpse into 
how does Paul get that tremendous freedom to be able to say, I'm ready? And how does he get that tremendous freedom in order to say, you know what, I'm not going not gonna to hold on to uh, hold on to that life. Um, instead, I'm going to obey. So this is Paul writing to, writing to Ephesus. This is page 453. I'm going to read two sections. And if you're reading in your Bible, this is in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. But storybook, it's uh, page 453. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And Paul's praying for them. And he's like, I want you to know God better. I want your eyes to be opened. You know, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you. And Paul's saying, look at the hope. I want you to be able to really see that hope. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. And Paul's saying he raised Christ from the dead. That same power has not gone away. It's here. And I just want you to be able to see it. He's going to pray more blessings over them. I'm going to flip to page 454. This is Ephesians chapter 3 um, for those in your Bibles. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, God is gloriously rich, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power, through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And the secret to freedom that Paul lays out in his prayer here is that the church knows that they're loved. The church knows just how much God loves them. And to know how much Jesus loves us. To trust him and the promises that he's given. Remember when he told his disciples, I'm going to prepare a home for you. I'm in my living room. It's a good, it's a good, good home. I know that there are some people who are worried about rent and who are worried about other scenarios. Um, God provides for his children. Um, and what Paul's talking about here as well is that we need to know how much God loves us. We need to be able to, to dwell and meditate on Jesus saying to us, I'm going to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. You know, if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you there. You think about time. Paul doesn't, anyone who knows Paul, in Ephesians later on, he's going to say, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Don't let anything slip. Like this guy is go, go, go. He's vibrant. You know, he's got passion. He's got fire. When he speaks, he gets into it. He's a fighter. He's a doer. He's an administrator, a teacher, a leader. Like he, like this guy 
Like, this guy lives. But he's not scrambling for time. He's not scrambling for time. Um, he's looking, he's like, do you know how rich your father is? You've got all the time in the world. Um, you know, eternity eternity lives be lies before us. Um, we're not short on time. You know, Paul's saying, make the most of every opportunity. But we may be short on time here. We don't get today back again. We get today for today, then we don't ever get it again. But our Father has eternity. We're not short on time. So when Paul says, I'm counting my life as nothing, I think one of the things he's really saying is, you know, to know, he knows the love of Christ. How high and wide and, you know, deep and long it is. He knows that. You know, he knows who he's going to meet. He's, and he wants the church to know that. So, I think when I look at Paul's freedom, what I see is that this freedom is rooted in just knowing how much God loves him. That he's free to obey. He's free to say, I'm ready. Because he is ready. Because he's looking at the hope. He's, he's soaked in the love of God. And what he wants more than anything is for the church to be looking at that hope. To be soaked in the love of God. And to realize that their effectiveness comes from this immeasurably great power of the Holy Spirit working in them. You know, to him who can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, his Holy Spirit. And so when it, comes, when it came down years ago to that choice of saying, I'm going to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit, um, Paul's not going to give that up. And that's consistent throughout everything he writes. You know, um, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. He's not going to threaten that um, because circumstances look one way. And so this freedom that he has is grounded in knowing how much God loves him. And this is true for us as well. The antidote to fear is knowing how much life we have. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, you know, and more life than you've ever known, you know, more life than you can imagine. And you know what? It's just true. We are free. We have this abundant life that we can't imagine. And it's tragic when we scramble and we give up that obedience and it's tragic when we give up that love and it's tragic when we give up that identity of people who are loved, people who are loving, um, people who have abundant life, people who have this abundant freedom. Um, the antidote to fear is to know that God loves us and because God loves us, we are free and we can be creative. Um, that's our safe space. John Cleese talks about making bounds of time and space, you know, to be creative and joke telling. Um, our safe space is that God loves us. So we can be creative and we can be free and we don't have to hold on to our anxieties. So kind of in this time and place, yeah, I'm home in my living room for two weeks, but uh, that's not the that's not the restriction that matters. The restriction that matters is in here, saying, am I going to be anxious? Am I going to hold back in loving? Am I going to hold back in obeying? Um, am I going to hold back in, in asking the question, what's God dreaming up right now? Am I going to hold back from those things because I'm anxious or because I'm afraid or because I'm distracted or like that's what's going to kill is holding on to these things and not not just accepting the truth that I am free. There's faith in that too because let's be honest, we're never going to feel perfectly. We're not going to see perfectly all the time. 
Um, we're not going to have perfect awareness of this. We're human. And that, that gap between what's true and what we perceive, you know, that's the gap that, uh, that the step of faith needs to step over to say, this is true. I don't feel it perfectly. I don't see it perfectly. Like, why is Paul praying for the eyes of their hearts to be enlightened? It's because we struggle sometimes, and we struggle to see it. We struggle to know it, and that's why he's praying for it. But there's that step of faith, you know, in that gap to say, I am going to act because I know this is true, and I'm going to obey because I know this is true. And when I think about what it means for us to be effective at the church as the church right now is we know that we are rooted and grounded in the love of God so we have this chance to to love one another in the same way to say yes there's a lot of other things going on but um, I want to be the church that loves right now with creativity and freedom and the the key to that creativity and freedom starts with do we know Jesus? Do we know? Like, do we know that he loves us? Do we actually believe in his promises of the life that he gives, of the place that he's making for us, of that we will be with him? You know, when, when our time here is over. <laughs> and the last place that I'm going to look kind of shows what happens if we do this. These are, uh, these are Paul's words to Timothy. Right close to the end, he's in prison in Rome again. Um, he writes this, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And there's that powerful word to us, you know, we should be longing for his appearing. But I read this and I see Paul saying, I'm ready. I'm done. I have fought. I have finished. I have kept. I have. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. He's done. You know, years ago, he was saying in Caesarea, he was saying, I'm ready to die in Jerusalem if I didn't, if I need to die in Jerusalem. He didn't die in Jerusalem. He died in Rome years later. But um, years ago, he was saying, I'm ready. But when he writes to Timothy, he's, he's also saying, and it, it feels to me like a little bit different way this time, saying, no, I'm ready. You know, I fought the good fight. Now... I'm okay to lay down fighting. And we see this, this vigorous man, this fighter, this runner, this competitor. Like he's, he's spent his life, like he's a driven person. His metaphors, he's a race. You got to win. It's a race. You got to win. Well, he's like, I fought. I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the, pay, the faith. And I just get this peace from him. He's, he's able to let go. And that's one of the most difficult things, I think, is, is, that, is that letting go. But he's got this piece to let go. And he's going to meet the one that he loves more than anything else. Because his identity isn't in everything that he's done. His identity has not been as an administrator. His identity has not been as a teacher. His identity has not actually been in his calling. 
He's, he's fulfilled his calling. He's run his race. He's fought his fight. But his identity at the end of these things, that's not what he's looking at right now. He's looking at the crown of righteousness. And he's looking towards that righteous judge and saying, yeah, he's going to give me a crown. And he's going to give me a crown of righteousness. Um, and there's peace in that. He's in the middle of this turmoil. He's in the middle of this tremendous persecution, Nero persecuting the Christians in Rome. And uh, everything's swirling around him. But he's got peace. And he can say, I'm done. And he's writing to Timothy, and he's like, yeah, bring me my books, bring me my coat. But he's ready. Such, I mean, Paul's so amazing. Um, and when I look around in Vancouver you know, giving a video message to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, and I don't know, whoever else is watching, uh, they can say, well, where does that put us? Um, I guess what I would say is, let's remember that God loves us, um, and let's love one another. Let's not give up the freedom that God has given us. Let's not give up the creativity in difficult times that, uh, that is available to us. But let's remind one another through our love that God loves each one of us. Um, let's pick up the phone, um, call, text, hanging out online, uh, sharing worship songs, you know, whatever it takes. Um, but let's help ground and root one another in knowing how much God loves us. Um, let's give fear and anxiety no place in these times let's like let's shift our focus let's uh let's help one another shift our focus to say god loves us and and we're free and we can be creative and loving um let's quiet ourselves remind ourselves let's pray remind ourselves that there's a voice that isn't fear and let's listen to to that voice let's listen to his voice instead Let's stay safe. Um, let's be smart. You know, let's not get one another sick. Um, but let's let love be our strongest word. Um, and I really pray that, as with Paul, you know, the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>